Okay, so as I mentioned last time uh, in the previous part, let's go over another example in which to find the null lines and equilibrium points. And then, you know, try to give an idea on how the solution looks like in terms of the direction of motion. Um, once again, let me, let me remind you, at the end, run these examples with the plotter because, you know, on, on paper or on the board, it's not going to be that easy to illustrate what happens. In particular, the stability, um, it's not easy to illustrate. Um, in general, um, just by looking at my uh, arrows, it, it, it can be done, but it's not easy to do it uh, by hand. So let me, before we do that, let me actually define briefly um, what a stable equilibrium looks like. Um, we're going to use for now the same intuitive definition that we use for single ODEs. So basically, we say that uh, an equilibrium um, AB is stable if nearby solutions starting nearby basically to that point uh, converge to it. Very intuitive definition because you'll see later for systems uh, you need to actually have a more detailed description to describe what happens basically uh, around that point. Because um, again you have 360 degrees of Pos possibilities now in terms of approaching the point or not. For a single OD is you have the equilibrium point on the line, you move either left or right around that point. So if you move toward the point from left and right, the point is stable. Now, for uh, a planner system with three equations, well, you can approach the point, but the shape of the way the, I mean, the, the shape of the solution around that point may be different and may actually reveal some other important properties about the system, as you'll see later. So it's a little bit incomplete description to say just whether it converges to it or not. It can converge, for example, in the shape of a spiral or a different shape, what we call later a stable node. Uh, even the opposite case, when it's unstable, uh, the geometry may look different depending on uh, some properties of the system that we will talk about. So in the case of linear systems, there is a connection between eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors uh, and the shape of the solution around the equilibrium point. But we'll, we'll talk about that when the time comes uh, when we deal with uh, linear systems. <coughs> so for now, answer this question if it's in the problem just based on what you see on the plotter. You click on several solutions around the point, and if it looks like the solution approaches the point, um, then of course um, you will say that the point is stable and unstable otherwise. If the problem is to find the equilibrium points, then it should be easy to find them, relatively easy, because if you have a highly nonlinear system here with more complicated terms, it may not be that easy to, to um, you know, find those, uh, those points. Um, so the way to do it, of course, is to set this equal to zero and try to find all the values of x and y that satisfy the system, right? Remember, each of them as a curve, if you plot it separately, it's going to be a null line. Taken as a system, if they intersect at any point, that point will be an equilibrium point. Um, so the way to do it is to pick an easy substitution if you have one, plug it in on the second equation. So for example, I can take y to be 4 minus x from the first equation. Um, and if I plug it in on the um, second one, I get 16 minus x squared minus quantity 4 minus x squared equals 0. Uh, let's expand that parenthesis. So we get 16 minus x squared minus 16 minus 8x plus x squared equals 0. Uh, Expand, you have some cancellation here, and we can um, combine the x squared and then pull out 2x. So remember, you need to solve the system for all possible solutions so that you can find all possible equilibrium points. Right? In this case, it's obvious that you're going to end up with two equilibrium points because this can be 0 either if x is 0, which going back to the substitution, that makes y equals 4. So you have 0, 4, one possible equilibrium point. Always write it like that as a pair of, as a 
point in the plane with coordinates x and y in that order. Or you could have x equals 4 by setting 4 minus x equals 0. And again, from that substitution, you get four equal, uh, y equals 0. And so the 4, 0 is the other equilibrium point. <coughs> Um, so these are the equilibrium points, and what about the null lines? Well, let's actually sketch at this point the um, the two null lines. So I'm gonna do it here. And so as I mentioned before, I chose this example with null lines that can be recognized in terms of how they look like. So this one is a line, obviously, right? Four minus x minus y. Um, is a line and the other one 16 equals 0 right so 4 minus x minus y equals 0 is a line 16 minus x squared minus x squared equals 0 is a circle uh, of radius um, 4 yeah I mean if you move this to the right hand side that's x squared plus y squared equals 16 which you should recognize as the equation of a circle with the uh, center at the origin at 0 0 and of radius 4. We know already that the two intersects at 0, 4, 4, 0. So we know already that the two curves will intersect right here. So this is, um, this is the point 4, 0, and this is 0, 4. And like I said, one null line is in the shape of a circle. So let's see if I can do my best circle with the with the empty with a with a free hand, and uh, the other one is a line that goes through these points. <coughs> so always remember what why, why you do this this exercise. I mean, what what's the point of this? The line, it's the null line for x. So the line separates the sine of x prime on the line itself. X prime is zero. The circle is for y prime. It separates the sine of y prime. And of, co of course, on the circle itself, y prime is equal to 0. OK, so y prime changes its sign whether you are inside the circle or outside the circle. And of course, here, x prime uh, changes its sign whether you are below the line or to the left of the line or up above the line. Uh, in terms of the test point, to quickly choose which one is which, positive or negative, the easiest test point, if you look carefully, is 0, 0. So just pick a test point that is basically not on either of these null lines, right? I mean, <coughs> in this case, 0, 0 works for both of them nicely, right? So for instance, for the line, 0, 0 is below the line. If I plug in 0, 0 into the x prime null line, x null line, that's a positive quantity. So below the line, x prime is positive, so the motion is to the right hand side. I'm going to make the label here by indicating the motion to the right. And if you are above the line, of course, x prime is negative, so you are below, I mean, you are uh, uh, moving to the left side, right, if you are above the line. <coughs> um, Right, so what about the circle? The same idea. Let's plug in the test point on the on the equation for y prime. So 16 minus 0 minus 0, it's positive. That refers, of course, so again, this one told me that x prime is positive below the line. And um, 16 minus 0 minus 0 tell me that inside the circle, y prime is also positive. So inside the circle, all the arrows should point upward and above the circle should point downward. <coughs> Just to emphasize, these are labels to indicate what that line um, tells you. Because in general, remember, the sign of the derivatives combine to tell you whether the arrow moves you know, uh, right up, um, left up, and so on and so forth. OK, so suppose, for example, you pick a random point here. Let's say you pick a random point over here and another one over here. So what about the arrows? <coughs> Uh, the direction of the solution. Well, you are below the line, <coughs> so you move to the right, you are inside a circle, you move up, so you should expect the arrow to be right and up. 
uh, this point here is above the line, the motion is to the left, you are above the circle, outside the circle, the motion is down, so left and down. And finally, this point below the line, motion is to the right, outside the circle, motion down, right and down. So on and so forth. So that's how you can tell quickly the direction of motion for all of these. As far, of th as, far as the stability is concerned, just uh, run the example, run the system with P plane, uh, or excuse me, with the plotter, and you'll see, let's see, because I wrote it here, you'll see that uh, zero 04 is the stable point and 40 is unstable. So run the example with the plotter. <coughs> Okay, so we will actually revisit, um, we're going to revisit the, um, uh, this uh, nonlinear systems at the end of the uh, class, as I mentioned before, and we're going to figure out actually a way to determine the stability in some cases without uh, resorting to the plotter. So we could do it with a mathematical tool called the Jacobian method. That's basically the last major uh, topic or the last lesson in the in the course. <coughs> but for the most part in this chapter we're going to deal with linear systems. So in the remaining um, minutes of this part we're going to talk about how we actually denote, how we define and denote linear systems. And we're going to finish with a quick example on a linear system and its solution. So most of the chapter is dedicated just like for single ODEs with dealing with um, linear systems. So, just like for single ODEs, linearity refers to the dependent variable. So when I say linear systems, I mean linear in x prime, y prime, x and y. Not the part with t. So if you have an unautonomous system in which the right hand side depends on t as well, that t doesn't have to be linear, right? There's no restriction. Linearity refers only to x prime, y prime, x and y. So for that reason, the general form or the standard form of a linear system that we're going to deal with in this class will be a linear system that has constant coefficients for the linear part. So a linear system that looks like this, x prime equals ax plus by, so some linear combination plus maybe a non-homogeneous term, let's call it g of t. And the second equation, of course, in the same form. Some combination cx plus dy and maybe a function of t if the system happens to be non-homogeneous. So that is the non-homogeneous linear system. Again, we're going to deal only with the case in which a, b, c, d are constants. Pretty much like analogous to the second order ODE, if you remember. We dealt with the second order ODE linear with constant coefficients. The only linear equation with non-constant coefficients for the linear part uh, was the first order ODE. We had that formula that deals with, with that equation. <coughs> but otherwise, we have these uh, constant coefficients for the uh, dependent variables. Um, and just like in the single ODE, the homogeneous linear system will simply look in the same manner except without g of t and h of t. So if these guys are both, it's important to understand both not zero. So if this is zero but this is not, it's still non-homogeneous as a system. So if they are both zero, you obtain what you call a linear homogeneous system of two equations and two unknowns. So in the beginning, we're going to focus on this one because the main idea of the solution or the main theorem of obtaining solutions of linear ODE is the two so-called two-step method still holds for systems. That's why I call it like the most important theorem in the class because it is just for linear, not only for linear ODEs, but for linear systems as well. So we should probably write it down here, the two-step method
uh, still applies. <clears throat> that means you're going to solve the homogeneous, so you're going to solve the homogeneous system first and we're going to have basically two sections on that there will be a, an entire discussion on how you do that because that's that's the part that is tied up to the linear algebra um, so we're going to take our time that's split in at least two days uh, of work for the homogeneous uh, system first and then um, the second step will be to find a particular solution um, for the full um, for the full system, non-homogeneous one, and this one actually will be easier than you may think in the sense that it will be familiar to you because we're going to use the same method employed for single ODEs. So we're going to use the method of undetermined coefficients. So the two-step method, you do this, and then of course at the end you add the two. I just want to remind you basically the, the two-step method, right? I mean, that's, that's basically what we follow through when we develop the theory of solving linear systems. We have to deal with the homogeneous part first, then we're going to have to deal with um, finding the particular solution. So before we move on, it's very important to actually understand now how we can write linear systems involving matrices, because that's the most efficient way of treating this problem via matrix theory, because the linear systems are very usefully described uh, via matrices. So <coughs> we're going to go over that. And it's important at this point, if you're not, if you're still shaky with matrix operation, to actually remember them or, you know, brush up on matrix addition, multiplication, scalar multiplication, and, and so on and so forth. But the reason why this linear system is so um, suitable for matrix notation, well, it's because of the properties of matrices. So I can treat the left side, if you look carefully, I can treat it as a column matrix. So I can take together x of t, y of t, together into a single column matrix or a vector, and just indicate that on the left side I take the derivative of that. And again, importantly now, on the right hand side, the linear part can be written nicely as a matrix uh, as a 2 by 2 matrix multiplied by the same column which indicates the dependent variables. So I can think of the column xy as my dependent variable in the matrix form. And I can write the whole system with a single row, like a single equation, um, if I pay the price, so to speak, of dealing with matrices instead of numbers. Um, so if it's not clear what I'm talking about here, remember the matrix multiplication, how do you do it? You multiply a row by a column, right? So it's A times X plus B times Y. There you go, that's the first entry. And then C times X plus D times Y, that's the second entry. And that's all there is to it if you have a homogeneous system. If you have a non-homogeneous system, any non-homogeneous part can be lumped together into another uh, column matrix. A G of T, H of T. So again, that's why, for instance, if G is zero but H is not, it's still non-homogeneous. As long as you have a non-zero column here added up, that's that's a non-homogeneous vector. Uh, with matrix notation, an important thing to keep in mind, uh, I'm going to use the bar notation, A, V bar, X bar, X bar of T, etc., to denote column matrices or vectors as they are called the textbook uses the bold face letter because well that's what they do but obviously it's it's not that um, easy uh, or um, comfortable to do that you know on the board so we're going to use the convention that whenever you see the bar on the top I mean a matrix with a single column so that means I can denote the left side of the system by x bar prime, okay, so x bar hides the two dependent variables. I can denote this matrix by big A, the way you typically denote matrices by capital letters, times x bar, that's matrix multiplication, 2 by 2, 2 by 1 gives you 
two by one, right? And then the non-homogeneous term can be lumped together into another vector or another column matrix depending on T. So that's a very nice, in my opinion, way, uh, not just my opinion, but that's, that's a nice way to represent a linear system in a very compact form. But again, it's critical to brush up on the matrix operations to be comfortable with this notation. It's analogous to single ODEs. As a matter of fact, a very nice analogy, when you look at just the homogeneous part, that's analogous to that single ODE that I asked you to memorize, the exponential one, right? When you have y prime equals a constant times y, right? So, um, you know, when you have it like that, when you have a number times y, that's an exponential. Here you have a vector and a matrix instead of a number. So. Um, this analogy actually is more important than you may think at this point because the, the way you actually write the solutions has to do with um, assuming an exponential format for the, for the solution. So you'll see when we get to solve the homogeneous part, um, the connection with the exponential ODE. So that's a standard form of a linear ODE uh, involving um, matrices. Um, and so before we move on to the last part, because I want to give you an example of a system written like that with its solution. Before we move on to that, let me just write down a typical notation for the solution. So when you solve the homogeneous part, so when you do the homogeneous part first, solution, we're going to use the convention of sub H just like before, except we're going to have a bar on the top. So remember, when we solved a linear equation with a two-step method, we said yh, right, to indicate that that's just the homogeneous part of the solution. Now, this will be a vector, OK, a column matrix, because it represents the two um, unknowns in the system. And the particular solution um, is going to be denoted by xp, right, so with the bar on the top. And so the full solution of a linear uh, system will be a f written like this, right? I mean, there's more to it, of course, than just these two symbols, but there will be a homogeneous part um, and then a particular solution. And the sum of the two will be the solution of the entire system. And another important remark, uh, which I want to mention here because I have enough room, just like second order ODEs, the systems of two equations and two unknowns, it's still of dimension two. So the solutions space for a homogeneous system like this is represented by two independent solutions. So there is a correspondence between the number of independent solutions that you need to solve the homogeneous one with the number of equations. So of course, in this class, we deal with uh, two by two systems. But if you are to deal with three by three systems, you will need three independent solutions. So to solve the homogeneous part of the system, um, you need two independent solutions. It's a complete analogy with the linear homogeneous second order ODE. So basically, the xh, just the xh component of the solution, is going to look like a linear combination of two independent solutions. So keep that in mind, because uh, it will be relevant when we move on on how to solve this, this uh, linear systems. And try to make this analogy with a single uh, ODE of second order. You needed two independent solutions um, to describe the general solution of the homogeneous part. Same thing uh, is true for a system of two equations and two unknowns, a linear homogeneous system. Just this part here will require two independent solutions to describe the full general solution of the system. So if you look at the formula sheet, you can anticipate a, a little bit. If you look at the formula sheet, you will see that the formula for the solution for the homogeneous part looks like that. More complicated than just this, but if you look carefully, it will be a combination uh, of two independent solutions. So let's finish with the third part uh, with an actual example. So I will just give you the system and the solution. And for now, all we do, we'll plug in the solution to verify that it's true. Um, and just to get uh, ourselves uh, accustomed with uh, how you actually do that via matrix notation.
So stay tuned for the third part.